Um, the whole idea of today's talk is probably half an hour talk about my philosophy or my take on transoral surgery. And one of the reasons I said from the outset to Peter that I'm very happy to be interrupted. It's what I talk about evolution of a surgeon. Uh, if I look back uh, 13 years back, I joined Derby, stroke, you know, um, roughly there or thereabout as a surgeon who has been trained to do um, reconstructive surgery. I'm one of the unique individuals in ENT who can do radial forearm flaps, etc. But, you know, as you, I'll show you today that it's, you know, evolved from not doing any further reconstructive surgery and to be part of the MDT and uh, provide a unique service. And my work has revolved around from laser to the robot and then laser and then robot. The reason being is that I've worked probably some of the time in Derby, some of you know that, and also now in Burnley. And what I'm going to talk today is how to sell yourself as a transoral surgeon. And you'll realize at the end of the talk, all you have learned how to do a tonsillectomy, nothing more than that, to be honest with you. And the other thing I would say that if you provide transoral surgery, you will find that out of those oropharyngeal cancers, one third, you'll save them having any radiotherapy or any chemo radiotherapy, which is a great news for the patient. Third of the patient, you'll find just give them radiotherapy, which is again a great news. You've avoided giving them chemotherapy. And unfortunately, the last third, you'll find the patient needs all three. And that is the debate we have because we haven't got a level one evidence for transoral surgery in oropharyngeal tumor or cancer practice. So the background, so one has to remember, I think it's more of when I started being an ENT registrar, Roughly millennium time. This is a paper, some of you know, who are diehard head neck surgeons or want to be head neck surgeon. It's a paper from America, from James Pearson, Florida, very clearly made sure that, you know, non surgery is the standard of care. Why? Because they've looked at 6,400 patients. And what are they? The group who are, had surgery followed by radiotherapy, and the group who had radiotherapy and then had neck dissection. And if you look at the tongue-based outcomes, and it's very obvious that both the groups, the outcomes are similar. And if you look at the severe complication rate, in, in, uh, on surgery side, you have 32% and 3.8% for the non-surgery side. You can't sell this operation anymore. And I'm talking in terms of an operation called commando operation by definition, but what you're doing in lip split mandibulotomy, taking the tonsils out or a tongue base out with a free flap, and then you're giving these individuals radiotherapy. So that, and if you look at the tonsil outcomes, it's almost mirror of tongue base outcomes, and therefore you can't sell your surgery anymore. Why would you do a 12 hour operation and then this individual goes for radiotherapy and, and then you see the outcomes are almost similar. So that's one paper you need to bear in mind. And then there are many papers there, but I've chosen a couple of papers. And the second paper is from Europe, which is French Head Neck Oncology Radiotherapy Group. And this paper, if you look at it carefully, they basically made sure that chemo radiotherapy be has become the standard of care. And if you look at the paper again, you find that although the HPV testings were not a normal, you know, in 90s and whatever in millennium, early millennium time, those patients were more HPV negative because in HPV positive uh, patients, you find the primary small, the secondary, you find big cystic nodes. But in this group of French patients, you'll find that the primary was very big and the secondaries were small, which basically indicated that this group of patients were more HPV negative. And there were 226 patients. It's a phase three multicenter randomized trial. So you have got hiding to nothing in front of your oncologist when you sit, sit in an MDT forum, which I do. And, uh, and you'll find that chemo radiotherapy is way better than radiotherapy, even though the outcomes you can see, they're not doing very well five year wise, but it 
clearly states it's almost like a laryngeal cancer that you can't cure these patients without CRT. So if you look at it, and those of you who are going for your exit exams, and I always say that all the time, is that oropharyngeal cancer, even now, don't go and tell them any transoral techniques, be it a TLM or a TORS or anything. You tell them that we're going to do scans, we're going to, which should, could be an MR, CT, we'll talk about it in later part of the talk. Do a biopsy, you can do it under local or do a UA proper and give them radiotherapy for early, chemo radiotherapy for the later group of patients. And that has been the norm. So we have to find a way around to come back to it. So this is a famous slide, guys. I think so. most of us have seen this. It's a slide from Canada, John Almeida, who is a, now I think he's an SOC prof there. It's when he was a regional fellow, he came up with this slide. And it's very obvious, if you look from 1980s till now, primary radiotherapy and used to be surgery with some adjuvant therapies, etc. Then came the TLM, then came the TORS. And then also you need to bear in mind your IMRT, which is intensive modulated radiotherapy. And these are all based on like, if you look at it, the VA trial, which there, then this analysis, which I showed you. And then you come with the HPV risk stratification. So that's when we started talking about more about TORS. The other thing you have to bear in mind that now, even today, when I was counseling a patient for a laryngectomy, the mortality rate for a major head and neck cancer in 1980s and even mid 90s, they were very it's higher than what it is now. Now you're talking about less than 1%. Also, the TLM has matured, TORS has matured, and I'll tell you why TLM is much difficult and much more complicated surgical technique and the learning curve is steeper compared to the TORS. So you have to remember that. You also have to think about the intensity modulated uh, radiotherapy because they have got loads of information on it and therefore you have to exist. So I, I'm talking from Birmingham and you know I would like to quote a Birmingham paper and you know those of you know John Watkinson, he was a thyroid surgeon, but I think this is his early kind of uh, experiences. And he wrote this paper in clinical otolaryngology. I think there's 20 odd patients. And he keeps on telling that Mriganka, just take the tonsils out, do a radical neck dissection and give it to the oncologist. And you may be able to de-escalate some of the therapy. There is no kind of evidence there. And it's again, it's not a level one evidence at all. But even in his kind of experience from, two, I, I'm talking millennium time, he was convinced that somebody will come up with some kind of technique and which will make a sense, you know, there is a sense to doing what I offer because, you know, I'm not just coming in and satisfying my surgical ego. And that is important. So the robotic surgery mainly came from Pittsburgh, um, sorry, from the Pennsylvania, from Gregory Weinstein's group. And the FDA approval, all of us know, is 2009. And the approval is for only for early oropharyngeal tumors. Few things have changed over the period, but that was what it was. So you need to remember that. But this paper I read all the time because Chris Holzinger mainly got all the process going with regards to the standardization of the technique. So this is where I, I'm slightly biased towards the robotics because when we do robotic resection, we do a standard technique. We follow a standard technique for whether we do a radical tonsillectomy or lateral oropharyngectomy, whatever you want to call it, or a tongue-based resection. These are standard operations. Whereas in laser, you are doing a piecemeal kind of Steiner resection. So you're stopping where the cancer stops and then you find a margin, etc. I'll go into a little bit in details when I talk about pathos trial. But you have to remember, this is the guy from the French guy, 1951. He spoke about, as I said, I'm going to teach you guys about steps of tonsillectomy. It's literally the steps of this radical tonsillectomy. And I'll go through step by step. And you'll learn why it's easier to teach a torse tonsillectomy compared to a TLM tonsillectomy. And by the way, TLM tonsillectomy is much more difficult compared to torse tonsillectomy.
So the other techniques, obviously, as I spoke about, you know, you need to know about Petra Ambrosius' paper, and some of you should go to Liverpool course or even go to Germany to see their technique, and it's mainly based on Steiner technique. And what they do, they cut through the tumor, find where the margin is, and basically it depends on your experience as well, which is very important. Now, the other paper is, is Kishan's paper from uh, Nova Scotia. I think he wrote it last year when he was a, a fellow over there. And uh, to be honest, he's now in Nottingham and it's a mixture of uh, basically cutting the tonsils out with a laser and with bipolar monopolar diathermy. And it's, I think this is published in Clinical Otolaryngology, how I do it section and what you're doing where you can't cut the laser, you cut it with the, uh, with the diathermy. So this is another technique, which is uh, from Jamie Jones, who is in Hull, and his uh, techniques available online. You can check it out. And what he uses, he uses uh, laparoscope instruments to visualize the oropharynx, and you are doing, um, you're using a, almost like a Colorado needle and cutting it out. And again, the most important thing you need to bear in mind, all these techniques, they are following the rules of engagement, where you are following the steps of lateral oropharyngectomy, and that is where the difference lies. So why do we do transoral surgery? What, where is my existence in Birmingham MDT? So it's very important that when I show you my results, you will see over 12 years where what I've done, it's not a big number, but it's probably a big number for anywhere in the UK. I would be surprised any, not many people would have done it, and probably if there are four or five people who would have done more than uh, me in that context. But what I've included my data for, where I have done the cases. And why? Because you're seeing more and more younger people. You're more seeing non-smoker HPV positive and negative. Sorry, I put down positive is my mistake. It should be HPV positive patients. So you have to bear in mind that. And also remember, Americans talk about HPV positive patients. They've got you know, tsunami of HPV positive patients. We don't have that. We always have smoker HPV positive or somebody who's been an ex-smoker. And even in the PATHOS trial, which I'll talk more in details, you'll see they've gone back then saying that six months ex-smoker kind of thing they're talking about. And they're also including the people who are vaping or e-cigarettes. Why? Because our uh, sort of uh, demographics is slightly different from American demographics. Now, I've just quoted a couple of the papers. There are stacks load of papers, but Again, I go back, there is no level one evidence to stand in front of any other oncologist to say, hey, the transoral practice is great. Because in fact, if you look at one of the papers which has come out, the Oreto paper trial, I'll talk a little bit, it's not pro TORS. In fact, it's slightly against TORS. So these are the papers you need to bear in mind where you can basically say that, look, the swallowing is better. And it's very obvious when you do that. But we haven't got the evidence. So this is a paper from Newcastle stroke Sunderland. And I think the guys have been looking at it for a while and they have demonstrated that the swallowing outcomes are certainly better with transoral surgery, be it with a laser at the neck, followed by a juven, whatever you give or don't give, or chemo radiotherapy. So it is very important to be part of a trial. Otherwise, your oncologist won't be allowing you to do any transoral surgery. However, there are units where their transoral surgery is a norm and is an accepted practice. So you're fine with that. But having saying that, like my MDT, transoral surgery is not a norm. You have to justify your existence. And I base it on Pathos trial and the Moses study, which is, uh, if you, those of you don't know, it's on tongue-based mucosectomy from uh, Vin Paleri and the group. Pathos is the study from, uh, from Cardiff and uh, Liverpool, and I'm part of it. And this ECOG 3391, some of you know that probably, this is an American study, orator trial, which I spoke about, which is a study from Canada. They had 64 patients, and they will keep on telling you, uh, your oncologist, oh yeah, your, your torse is slightly inferior. That's not the case, guys. If you look at 64 patients, I think 34 on each arm, the power calculation, I'm not a, any academic. You can tell that it's not very good power uh, study. And also, if you look at the key points are, when they did transoral surgery, they have done a tracheostomy for those patients. 
which is defies my logic. I've not done a tracheostomy on any of my transoral surgery as a, you know, a, a, as a starting point. So they have done that. And obviously that will have an impact on the swallowing as you all of you know that. A best of trial, which is from, uh, again, uh, from, uh, you know, from Europe. And it's, it's again, similar to pathos. It's for T1, T2, and where they're giving radiotherapy versus transoral surgery. So I'm just going to dwell on you know, the PATOS trial because it's very important. It's for HPV positive. I put T and M7 edition because that's what we use now, but you can use the eighth edition. Remember, it's one to three, T1 to T2 and T3, up to N2B, not N2C, so no bilateral necks. And you can do either a TORS or a TLM. I've got patients with TORS in the PATOS. I've also got TLM patients in the PATOS patient trial, I do not have endoscopic resection patients in the PATHOS trial because I don't do them. It's mainly based on swallowing assessment. So the key point is M studies and video fluoroscopies. I'm not going to dwell on what, you know, what their studies are, but you need to be part of it. So if you have a group one, which is a classic T1 or a very small T2, R0 resection, no adverse features, and that's the one for the best of and all the trials. You can observe those individuals, and you obviously got to do a swallowing assessment. Now, this is why I wanted to share this pathos because I still believe some of us, ENT, MaxFex, or even head neck colleagues, wherever, they don't have this understanding. The main idea of pathos trial or the ECOG is to find out what is it useful in trans oral for HPV positive, and secondly, what about the margins? Do you need that five millimeter or more margin? Do you need ECS? So the group B, which I've had few patients, very clear, T1 to T3, and then you have margin one to five millimeter. And this is what I wanted to share, say. If you are doing TLM, they ask us to do eight marginal biopsies from eight corners of your fossa or tongue base, whatever it is. Because remember, in TLM, you stop where you think you got the margin, and then you do the, uh, your marginal biopsy. And that's where I feel slightly uncomfortable, having done TLM probably more than a lot of people. And you are looking for if there is any PNIs or PVIs, which is very important. So they are, look at this, they are randomizing to 50 grade 25 fraction over five weeks, which is way less than what we give to these individuals. Think about it, you go to any MDT who don't have pathos trial, you do this operation, you will give this patient's chemo radiotherapy and you're gonna give full whack of chemo radiotherapy. But here in pathos, you can even go to 50 gray or even in the, where you've got the control arm, you're going giving 60 gray, which is less than what you do for a, anybody who's got margins positive. By definition, you've got margin involvement here. You've got uh, you know, adverse features. So next bit, which I want to share with Pathos, and that's what has been discussion even in Birmingham MDT, where ECS, you know, we look at a you know, scan and we say, oh, you got ECS, you can't do any transoral surgery. That's not the case, actually, because if you are in Pathos trial, you can put this patient in the trial and offer. And the reason I feel, you know, you know very much for it, because when you give patients chemo radiotherapy, you're looking after those patients for a long, long time. And your heart sinks when you see these people don't swallow. Not everybody does that, but there are people who don't do well at all. They don't swallow for a long period of time. I've had patients where I've done a tongue-based mucosectomy and I found a T1 tumor with an N2B node with ECS. What did the patient get? Chemo radiotherapy and the patient can't swallow. He's got a rig in place or peg in place and you know that's it you are gone for the whole life so that is why this group is important and even now i think they are a bit apprehensive my oncology colleagues and forget oncology colleagues some of my head and neck colleagues who don't do transoral beat ent beat max Facts, they don't really get this quite a lot so this is very important okay so what are the absolute contraindications so you don't do transoral, which is very obvious. So if you have tonsil, which is going to pre-vertebral fascia, don't do it. You can't resect the nodes, don't do it. Mandibular invasion, you can't do it. The important thing about tongue base, if it's involved more than 50%, I won't do it. In fact, if it's somebody approaching, nearing the midline, I don't have the courage to do it, I don't do it. 
because you are going to scupper this individual's swallowing for the rest of their life. Pharyngeal wall. The other important thing, and I'll show you in a, you know, you know, when you go to MDT nowadays, and even wherever, which MDT you go, the MRI scan is mostly done, yes, soft tissues, but also done for oncologists so that they can plan out the radiotherapy. However, if you're a transoral surgeon, you want to know more. You want to know about the transoral anatomy. And I hope when Ajit was going to give you a talk, or probably he's going to give you a talk sometime over a period of time, he talks beautifully about the transoral anatomy. And I've put some slides from Pittsburgh, a good friend of mine, Uma Duvery, has given me those slides, which is an amazing slide. And it's a new understanding of the anatomy, which you have to know from MRI scan. And especially, you need to know where the carotid arteries are because you don't want to get in there. And that's the reason why some of the guys don't like doing this operation because you're working around the carotid artery. So what are the relative contraindications? And it's very obvious, you know, these are the relative contraindications. In fact, you can take them on if you get a bit senior. If you don't want to take them on, nobody will criticize you. However, you need to bear in mind this. So access is very important and it, it, these are eight T's all of us should know for your exit exam or any exam or anything you do. If you don't know them, don't do any ENT. In fact, that is very important. And I'm not going to dwell on that. So how do I investigate? Most of the time, as I said, if it's an HPV positive patient, it's an ultrasound core biopsy of that cystic lump if you can get it, which is a great news because core is very important because you'll be able to know the patient's uh, HPV status. You need to do a CT and MR. And as I said, MRI scan is very, very important. And the pen endoscopy or EUA, whatever you call it, should be done by the transoral surgeon. Why? You have to assess the access, which is the most important key, the key to doing trans or performing transoral surgery. And I always Put this thing up and i remember all those i think probably seven eight years back i put it up in a west midlands uh, training day and i don't think anybody knew the name i think everybody knows i think this is an fk retractor and without that you can probably do tonsillar transoral surgery but you can't do tongue base uh, surgery you probably can get away with it but you also need to know how to sort of build it up and you need to put it in and see whether the access is good or not and similarly, you can't forget your Boyle Davis mouth gag. So this is what I'm talking about. This is a beautiful case where you have a large uh, node in the level two area. And this is your primary. It's a lower part of your tonsil. And you can see there's a good plane. It's not going into the parapharyngeal space. You can see the carotids and a lot. And you also can see it's not involving the base of tongue, which is a well-localized tumor. and if it's an HPV positive, then you can do uh, trans, you can perform transoral surgery. So this is the next one where you cannot do transoral surgery, uh, and this is involving the base of tongue. This is what I want to share because you find quite a lot of the patients who come in having had tonsillectomy, and this is a T2 tonsillar tumor had a tonsillectomy by my colleagues, and there is no sign of cancer there. So this lady underwent fossa resection because you see the vessels there, a bit twisted. It gave me a bit of, a bit of apprehension when I'm doing it. I'll tell you what this other vessel, vessel is in a second. And, uh, and there's no nodes. So I did a fossa resection with uh, transoral robotic surgery and neck dissection. So I'm going to, I'm, I think I'm getting to 30 minutes, so I'm going to skip through some of it. So palatine tonsil, for those of you who are absolutely junior, this is... We, we all should know this. Now, I'm going to come to more important bits. So, again, the blood supply is very important. And I'm going to go into the blood supply in a bit, uh, in more in details. Okay. So, the blood supply is mainly from the lingual artery, from the ascending pharyngeal artery. And, obviously, you get the tonsillar branch of facial artery. And you need to take care how you address them. And you need to remember ascending palatine artery as well. The nerve innervation, important because the glossopharyngeal nerve will come on your way when you do a radical tonsillectomy. I know all of us have done a tonsillectomy. The reason you don't see it because you don't cross the constrictor muscles at all. 
So this is the anatomy which I used to, I was giving a talk in Baco for, uh, for one of the instructional sessions, that's medial to lateral. So those of you who are very junior, mucosa, submucosa, pharyngovessular fascia, then you've got the constrictor muscle with a bit of a middle constrictor in there, and then you've got the buccopharyngeal fascia, and that's the lateral bit. So the blood supply, that is for the tongue base. The lingual artery is very important, and I'll go through the lingual artery where it comes because you need to be ready for it. Otherwise, it becomes a bloodbath, uh, to be honest, because it bleeds, and I've had few instances. So you need to be aware of that. You need to remember where the hypoglossal nerve is because you don't want to cut that because it'll be a disaster because remember the swallowing is the most important thing. If you cut this lingus hypoglossal nerve, the patient ain't gonna swallow. And you can get hypoglossal nerve neuropraxias as well. I will touch base and I'm happy to discuss that as well. So this is, I'm grateful to Uma who is a Pittsburgh professor and he is, I think those of you want to do transoral surgery, these are amazing articles in laryngoscope and I've borrowed some of that and I've used it many a times in my life. So this is what I was talking about. So you've got the muscles. These are the styloid muscles, which is your friend, which are your friend. Without that, you will not be able to survive. And that's your artery, which I'm talking about ascending uh, palatine artery, which is your friend. And you probably have to deal with it, whether you like it, your vessels in the neck or don't ligate it but you can't get scared because the idea is to have you to have a control of the vessels in the transoral planes and also in the pharyng parapharyngeal space and also in the neck so in the three different areas so you can't chicken out and say oh god i can't do it because it'll bleed if you're not being careful so this is a, a slightly better picture and you can see this is external carotid artery, internal carotid artery, that's your styloglossus and that's your stylopharyngeus and you need to remember that and that's your vein there. So I'm going to go in more details now and as I said ascending palatine artery is got Mr. different I can interrupt you a second. Sorry, yeah. Someone just wanted to know a bit more about the hypoglossal neuropraxy you're talking about. So I think someone, no, hypoglossal neuropraxia can be caused by use of uh, the retractor. The FK retractor is a vicious thing. It's quite hard. It causes tongue congestion. So usually people should release the gag every 30 to 45 minutes if you can, partly to avoid congestion of the tongue and you can get a significant tongue swelling and also there are papers, I think um, Rohan may be in the, in, in the audience as well, which shows that you, know, you can get neuropraxias of hypoglossal and other stuff like lingual and nerves and all those things from the gags as well. So you need to be aware of that. And especially when you're doing tongue-based resections, the hypoglossal nerve is not far from your lingual artery. And I'll show you in the picture going forward, yeah? So going with the uh, anatomical variations of ascending palatine artery, I know if, I, I don't think it's necessary for every one of us, but people who are gonna do transoral surgery, you need to know, it usually comes off the facial artery and it crosses, that's your styloglossus, and it crosses there, guys. And then you've got the, it also, it comes off the facial artery and it can stay between styloglossus and stylopharyngeus. And I'll show you in my own dissection, it is, you know, I've not found the nerve artery yet, but you can get it and you can encounter it and you need to be aware of it. And then the other picture is the, in the one from the previous slide. So this is something you need to bear in mind because this is a, a, a disaster thing. So what you can find, you can find a carotid knuckle because as I said, that styloglossus and stylopharyngeus saves you from cutting through the vessels but sometimes you can get a variation, which is the carotid knuckle, and you can see this. Also, again, going back to Ajit George's talk, he talks about facial artery variation as well, which is his new baby, which is found from his paper where he's done 40 odd dissections. And I don't have the slide for it because these are the slides I'm using with permission of uh, Dr. Durovi, and therefore I'm happy to use it. And he's also happy to share the slides with you guys. So you need to bear in mind that. So, Styloglossus is a muscle, and I'm going to just touch base for those of you guys who are going to go MCQs, and it probably will come up. So it arises from the anterior and lateral surface of the styloid process. 
and it goes inferior medially between the IC and ECA. You need to remember that. And it goes and attaches to the lateral aspect of the tongue near its dorsal surface. And I'm going forward. People are get, getting more and more, uh, un, you know, uh, they're understanding more and more about this transoral anatomy. And it's more complex than what I'm talking about. You need to remember the ascending palatine artery. I'm going back because it's a bloodbath if you hit it, especially with the laser you can. It crosses over the inferior third of the styloglossus muscle, which is the closest to the tongue. And you will be I'll talking about styloglossus muscle's importance when you do radical tonsillectomy in a bit. And stylopharynges, on the other hand, it's like a fan-shaped, big, thin, slender muscle. So you need to bear in mind as well that muscle. And the other thing you need to remember is stylopharynges, the glossopharyngeal nerve runs on the lateral surface of this muscle. So you need to remember that. Why? Because ideally, one must preserve glossopharyngeal nerve if you can. However, as I said in the slide itself, and which I've shared before as well, if you need to cut it out because of the oncologic clearance, you do that. But you, you know, all practical purposes, you should see the nerve and preserve the nerve. So, as I said, this is the most important slide for radical or of a, a tonsillectomy. This is what was described in 1951, and this is what has been practiced by most of the trans oral surgeons. So you incise through the pterygomandibular raffi, you identify the parapharyngeal space, and I'll show you in the pictures, with help of medial pterygoid tendon. Then you take the constrictor, medialize that from the fat, and you mobilize the superior tonsil pole, and make sure that you've taken enough of soft palate. And then you go down, and then you free up the style of pharyngeus and constrictors. And then you need to find the base of tongue, cut it out, make sure that you've taken enough. And as I said, and I'll show you in the uh, pictures, that you have to resect at least a centimeter of the style of tendon. And this is where, if you get scared, you will not get a margin and you'll end up giving this patient chemo radiotherapy. And also remember the index cuts for the posterior pharyngeal valve because you don't want to take too much of the posterior pharyngeal valve. Otherwise, the patient will sw won't swallow. So for you guys who are very junior, this is pterygomandibular raffi, which is where you want to make a cut slightly higher. Don't get worried about it because you want to get the plate. So this is a picture from, again, from, I think, Hini's paper, which is a cadaveric picture. And this is a right tonsil, this, this thing is your medial pterygoid tendon. This is your friend. And these are the vessels. These are the constrictor muscles, OK? Now I'm going to go into my own picture. So this is a patient undergoing right tonsil fossa resection. You can see the tonsillectomy has been done. And you can see I've made the index cut, and I've made it slightly higher. I'm not worried. Yes, you can get a bit of uh, sort of nasal regard but it usually settles down and you need to make it higher. And I'm going to go to the other patient where I'm going to go with this patient because I've got the steps in this patient. So the index cut there, remember not to hold any of this tissue with this forceps, which is Maryland bipolar forceps. That's what I use. And I use a five millimeter instrument this side, 12 millimeter instrument this side. So that's what I do name of the game or aim of the game here is to find your pterygoid or medial pterygoid tendon because you want to find the fat because the behind the fat is your carotid vessel especially the internal carotid artery if you cut that you're not going to practice as anything so that's your good sort of documentation of your medial pterygoid and you can see i'm not holding any of the tissues you should be holding this like a claw. Those of you who have been to robotic theaters, you should open up the jaw of this instrument. Sorry, where is it gone? And you medialize this. And then you try to find the fat. You also can see the suction of my colleague there. And we usually use two suctions to retract. And there you are where I'm holding it. And that's your fat. And you don't want to go in there because you are not going to be practicing with the patient going to die. So that's what you need to do. Gentle dissection down inferiorly. And then you're trying to find. Yeah. So. Sorry. Peter. 
you're trying to find Terry uh, style of dye from here and this is what the picture from Hini's paper again that's your constrictor muscle with a bit of tonsil cadaveric picture remember you need to remember that's your fat over the carotid that's your medial pterygoid your friend that's your glossopharyngeus and that's your styloglossus guys so you have to find this you can't panic because your vessels there or whatever you have to find it you need to cut it cut it one layer by layer so that it will ping this side so they got a centimeter clearance there so this is what i'm doing here you can see there's our fibers of the styloglossus and i'm taking it layer by layer and you can see my colleague they've got one sucker she has and there's another sucker there and what we are doing is we are gently cutting it through so that we are not touching any of those tissues there even with that it looks like a dog's dinner unfortunately but you can still see what i'm doing so this is coming to the end you can see i have made the index posterior cuts and i am removing the whole tonsil with the constrictor with the styloid muscles and i have made the cuts for the base of tongue so this is the ultimate result so you can see that's that's your posterior pharyngeal wall i have not gone too far medially and you can see the shiny bit is the pre-vertebral fascia people forget that and that is very very important you're not breaching this if you breach it then you're going to have pain problems and all those and that's your fat with everything exposed and then you panic and you can see i've taken a part of the soft palate as much as possible and the patient is definitely going to have a bit of nasal regurg they usually settle down so this is again going back to the picture that's your medial pterygoid that's your vessels that's your shiny bit of your pre-vertebral fascia that's your index cut that's your uvula that should be what you should be ending up after an radical tonsillectomy or lateral oropharyngectomy so we usually orientate in this board which is a new invention of ours i think there are people maybe using it because this is from the breast cancer surgeons and you can orientate take a picture tell exactly what you want to hear from your uh, uh, pathologist so that there is no debate and this is i think is a second look procedure that's why the specimen is small so i think this guy is from uh, uh, okay, one, yeah. one quick question, that's right someone said from in your experience how long does the nasal regurge take to settle after an oropharyngectomy like this i think if i'm very honest it varies if i'm being very honest because i don't want to be cocky because People say, oh, ours don't work. It can last uh, you know, a fair enough few months, actually. But as long as you counsel a patient appropriately, as long as you give a patient time for a speech and language therapy, going through the exercises, the swallowing exercises, you definitely see some improvement. OK? So going, yeah. That's great, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is a new paper, I think December 2019, and you can see we have the transoral surgeons from Italy have come up with type 1, type 2, type 3. I don't think uh, British surgeons, UK-based surgeons use this, but it will come, it will become a norm. So it's there in the presentation, you can look into it, and the paper is there in, in public domain as well. So coming back to the base of tongue, to be honest, base of tongue operation, if you do it with laser, it takes ages. But if you do it the, with a robot, you can get it out. Tongue-based mucosectomies, 45 minutes. Tongue-based resections for a tumor, it depends. You can do it in half an hour as well. But important thing for those of you, you need to remember the palatine tonsils on the side, the circumvallate papilla, and then you have your pharyngoepiglottic and glossoepiglottic fold there. But as I say, that's your lingual artery that's your where you earn your living so when you do a mucosectomy you're not going through the muscle you need to remember that it's very important you're just removing the lingual tonsil and this is where my view having done tongue-based mucosectomy with a laser quite a lot in my life and the torse mucosectomy i believe because of the greater vision and 360 vision you get uh, with the tours, either with the robot, you get a better yield 
of lingual tonsils with mucosectomy. And that is, maybe there's an element of bias there, but uh, I believe that you get a better yield with uh, mucosectomy uh, with uh, TORS. However, I'll show you in one of the papers, in fact, laser gave more diagnosis than the TORS. But having saying that, the number of laser papers were less compared to the TORS. But you have to remember, the hypoglossal nerve is there. You also need to remember the, your uh, you have to ligate this lingual artery when you're doing it. So again, the same picture and the pictures, I can, I'm very happy, I think Wahida was going to share with you guys. And these are there anyway, if you look at Haney's paper. Um, so the main steps are, in nutshell, you have to cut through the posterior third of the tongue. You need to cut the midline cut first because you need to make sure that you get to the vellicular. It's a cheating way because you can find the depth you also have to remember that when you're cutting, you're not cutting through the tumor. So therefore, it's very important that when you start doing tongue-based tumors, you have a fair amount of experience with transoral practice. And therefore, you need to be doing your tonsils, which are easy. You can be done with any technique. But tongue-based, I must say, TORS comes into its element. Whatever anybody says about TLM, they may have a better practice. But I always found TORS was easier. I've done a fair few tongue-based resections with the TLM in my previous life, but it's always, I found it difficult. And also, remember, this clipping of the lingual artery, you definitely need a very good assistance. So I've always done robotic resections, whether I was in Derby with my colleague in Derby, and now in Birmingham with my colleague, because it's important that you have a very good pair of hands, because that artery bleeds like anything, and if you're not good at it, it you will become a pool of blood, and you don't see anything. So this is a picture again, it's uh, just to doc show you guys what you do. It's nothing fancy and I've not put any videos because it just sometimes doesn't work. And my computing skills are not great. My registrars will tell you that. So this is a good picture of a T1 uh, tongue base uh, case in Birmingham. And you can see that we got a very good margin in this lady and she doesn't need any treatment whatsoever. She's done really well. And it also depends on how you counsel these individuals. So the important thing, why I believe, and I'm very happy to be interrupted, I have lost patients while doing a transoral surgery. And that happened in, uh, over in Derby on a 20th case. And this is when I learned more about transoral anatomy and how you can survive in front of the coroner if you are careful. So this is what is important. So the first thing you have to do, prophylactic neck dissection. I always like doing it before rather than after. I ligate all the arteries if I can. I don't try to do it external carotid artery ligation if I can. I do lingual facial and ascending pharyngeal. And even after ligation, that's how I survived that 45 minutes of interrogation by coroner and the lawyer because I showed that Pittsburgh paper had 226 or whatever patients they had, and they showed that even after ligation, they haven't made that, you know, sort of catastrophic bleed down to 0%. They had 4 or 5%, and they had mortality in that group. So you have to bear in mind, and you also need to bear in mind, if the oncologists are giving you grief, tell them they also get a lot of mortality from their chemo radiotherapy. So you have to remember. And also, you need to remember about the anatomical variation. So you have to remember transoral, parapharyngeal, and you have to remember uh, the, the variations in the neck. So this is a good picture by Peter. Thank you very much. So this is your hypoglossal nerve. This is your ascending pharyngeal artery coming out of the external carotid, probably one of the ones where I really got one. This is your IJB, sorry, going back. And this is common facial. This is your lingual and facial or loops, loops around it. So this is a very good picture where what you can do. And I like it. I put double liger clips there. And why is it important they're sending? Because if you look at it, sorry, the slide slightly upside down, but this is the commonest A where it comes up of the external carotid artery. But you can find there are uh, variations where you don't find ascending pharyngeal. And did I have any experience like that? Yes, I have. You know, even here, I had patients where I've just ligated facial and um, lingual and carried on because I knew that there's, none, there's no ascending pharyngeal because you go all the way up and you can't find. And the patient where we lost in Derby, my colleague and the registrar, maybe on today, 
uh, that you know they put the the tie on the right place because I was there in the post mortem because I made sure that I had defended my practice or our practice well enough. And also the guy who was doing the post mortem, he was grateful that I was there because obviously the guys who do post mortem they don't do head and neck anatomy very well. And we showed that we put the ligation in the right place and we defended based on the Pittsburgh paper. So this is why you have to learn from your experiences. And the other thing I say, as I said in the beginning, I was a free flap surgeon. So now I use my free flap skills to prepare the vessels, which all of you guys who do ENT, look at your head and neck colleagues, you'll find that they don't do carotid dissection at all because you can get away without carotid dissections. So that's where my skill comes handy. Tongue-based mucosectomy, this is a paper. Mr. From, Dave, yes. can I just clarify then, do you, do you ligate the vessels in every single tors or pharyngectomy that you do then, even if it's like an end neck that you're not opening? Absolutely, because I've lost a patient and I lost the patient even after tying off the vessels. And there are many factors in that patient which really went against. And the worst thing was there was a T1 lower pole tonsil with end knot. And you can imagine, even after tying the external carotid, I lost that patient. Rather, we lost the patient because I've, every single robotic case, I've done it in pairs because it's important. Okay. It's still a learning curve, remember, for all of us. Sure. Um, okay, so tongue-based mucosectomy, this is a paper by uh, Saida. I think this is a paper written by Hisham with all of us in Birmingham and Vin and everybody. And they looked at it, the usual Hisham, Professor Mehanas, uh, work is beautiful and they looked at how useful tongue-based mucosectomy is and I put one line you know 64 percent that's number and near 60 percent you find something even after everything being negative where you've done you know tonsillectomy negative you've done the PET MR and the and your CT so it is useful one thing from that paper as I mentioned he, she found that uh, TLM was better in picking up the cancers than TORS. However, she only had three TLM papers. So it may be that the TLM was done by a very experienced uh, transoral surgeon. So this is a picture of a look at the, how big the mucosectomy is. And this chap, I think some of the registrars in here will know, he had this tiny, uh, I think it was a two millimeter or even less 1.3 millimeter tumor there and he had an N1 disease and to be honest the chap has avoided any treatment because I've gone back and resected that area showed them there's nothing so by definition it was a T1 N1 disease and had it been for my previous experiences this chap would have received chemo radiotherapy because I don't know the margin with you know in my previous life and that is what the TORS gives you that's why the maturity in transoral practice gives you so the complications of the TORS, you need to remember the hemorrhage is three to four, ten percent. You can't run away from it. The mortality is there. It's from aspiration of blood and asphyxiation. And that's what you need to remember. Salivary leak, which is interesting. If you look at Australian experience from Adelaide and all those people, they get salivary leak and we don't. The reason I'll explain when we do neck dissection for oropharyngeal cancer in the United Kingdom, we do two, three and four dissection. Whereas they do one, two, three, and four over down in Australia. And they found that when they have removed the salivary gland, which is submandibular gland, they had some leaks. So we don't get it. And they also describe some technique with a digastric flap and whatnot. But we but you need to bear in mind, if you're doing a deeper dissection, you need to bear in mind the salivary leak is possible. So the TORS program. What is very important, those of you guys want to do transoral surgery, the fellowship is available. But when you come back, check the business case. Don't just dive in and start doing it because you'll be stopped from doing it. And it has happened in my life in Dar Derby, as, you, as I was mentioning. And we restarted the program, but has been very difficult. However, in Birmingham, we've been very careful in case selection and how we present. So what we have done, regular audit, presentation of those audit in front of the management so that we are you know, above board, so that everybody knows whether we are doing it correctly, whether the swallowing has been affected or not. It's very important to go on a case observation, the guys who don't do fellowship. And in fact, even after fellowship, it's wise to go on a case observation because things you see as a consultant, you're not gonna see as a fellow. 
because that's why people need some people need three years or two years to mature as a consultant so it's very important to know that console time which means basically sitting in front in the console and playing those games some of you are better than me in that and you can do that but nowadays the intuit intuitive guys are very very strict because i've been to the cadaveric dissection course twice first time round when i went nobody checked how many how much console time i had but this time round they were making sure that i was scoring more than 90 95 percent on the tasks they have and they're not easy tasks guys and you have to you can't cheat so therefore it's important cadaveric dissection is very very important as i showed you you can see a lot of anatomy which you don't see normally but it's very important to understand that the dry run i cannot say how important it is which means that you have your anesthetist you your colleague surgeon your uh, robotic nurses and you basically have a simulation and use simulation you do the simulation with the robotic wrap because remember they probably can do better robotic surgery than you can do and that is the show uh, that's the correct thing actually so that's what you need to do and you need to have proctored cases and to be honest, if I look back at my experience, this time around, I've been very, very rigorous. So when I did a tongue-based mucosectomy, I had been down to see me. And having done, and I'll show you my figures, I've done a lot more than a lot of people. And I make sure, Vin, you need to be happy that I'm doing it well. And when I did my lateral oropharyngectomy, he was there. When I, I didn't get him for a tongue-based uh, resection because I was happier by then. We maintained the audit. And ideally, you want to get the proctor back when you've done 20 to 30 cases to reassess and see if you relearn anything more because you want to progress. So patient selection is very important. You need to be part of a trial. Ideally, you should do T1, T2 tumors. Tongue-based mucosectomy is absolutely 100%. And try doing it. If you have a robotic program, do it with a robot. Don't do it with a laser. Then you'll be struggling to justify your existence. And it's very important. So it's important that you have a robotic team, which includes your anesthetist. Why? He has to be or she has to be very comfortable with airway so that they don't get jumpy because they are miles away from the patient. They know what it means so that they go and do a case observation involved in the dry run. Get them involved with the robotic rep. And other important thing is the pain control. You need to have a proper pain pathway. Otherwise, this guy is not going to swallow. And that's why you need your speech and language therapist going and visiting centers like in, even to us or anywhere where they do a lot of transoral stuff to understand what exercises they need to give. And you need to hit them early before. It's almost like how you prepare for major resections like laryngectomies or free flaps. You need to treat it like that. It's not just all oh, going and doing a tonsil. Otherwise, you will not achieve your goal. And it's important that you involve everybody in this. So this is the layout. Everybody can look it up. It's there in Pittsburgh, in everywhere, you know, and, you know, from uh, Gregory Weinstein's video. And this is the layout you need to have. This is a old fashioned rev robot. You've got XI systems. I don't. We have SI. So you can see the layout is important. You can see that you can't see the console surgeon at all. So this is very important. And you also can see that the nurse who is very important is next to it. And the, you can see the anesthetist miles away reading a newspaper or something. So this is slightly different. And that's why the dry run is important because the nurses will not know how to dock a robot for a head and neck resection. This is what you do. And this is very important. Ideally, you should mark out the floor because they will be used to putting the robot in the wrong way around because they mainly robots being used for urology cases. So this is important that angulation is correct. Otherwise, remember, the robot is mainly for abdominal surgery or urology, not for uh, head and neck surgery. So this is, uh, is my picture from uh, 2014 or something. This Balas Hamburg is from Hamburg. He was my first proctor. You need a dual console, ideally because you can take up if there's any issues and you also can train your juniors, etc. And it's easy to train compared to laser or surgery because the steps are standard. There's no deviation from the steps, whether you do a tongue base or a tonsil resection. So this is how you dock and you can see it's quite claustrophobic and that is very important. That's why some of us don't like doing this operation. And there are many things you can use to make your life easy. Look at this 
shield I we, uh, we are using there, which increases and reduces the clash and etc. And I'm using an FK retractor here. And I like putting nasal tube uh, because it goes out of the way. There are people who put oral tube and stitch it up in one corner. I'm not a great fan of that. And that's me. And I can show you, this is what you suspend. You can suspend like that. But nowadays you have Olympus has a suspension as well, which is very, very good. So the instruments you need, all these instruments. And these are the cannula because you need a five millimeter, which you will not have in a robotic tray because they don't. You also need this monopolar spatula. You also need the dissector. If you are doing free flaps or something, you need a bipolar forceps. And that's how you hang it if you can, if you're posh. And these are the instruments. You need to have this. And this is a little, just a slide. This is a pleomorphic salivary adenoma. This was my first robotic case. Try to select the easiest case known to mankind because you'll be worked up. You'll be observed by a proctor and everybody else so that you, know, you are really tense and you want to make sure that it goes very well. And that's what I did. And that's my end result and a young lady. And this PSA of soft palate, and that's what you choose. So, as I say, I did 36 patients with my colleague, Mr. Mo Sean Mortimer. And these are, you can see, we did very number of cases, many different cases. And you know, some of it's done by Sean as well. And you can see what I wanted to show that HPV positivity was very low. Maybe the fact that we were not doing the testing there, and maybe also we were trying to do a lot more than what we do now. So nowadays, if you look at my Birmingham experience, I did TLM, as I said, I came back, I started doing TLM again because there's no robot. And that was the number, it's super selective cases. And they're all HPV positive. I have not done any single HPV, I think one single HPV negative. But having saying that, I've been very, very careful in my case selection because I don't want the program to fail because already we do not have a level one evidence. So that's what I wanted to share, guys. And also, if you look at my, my graph for overall survival, it's nothing different from anybody else. So I'd like to thank, as I said, Dr. Dubery and Kish, if he's there, but you know, he's been great help for my back of presentation and Peter and Wahida, without them, I won't be able to present today. So Peter, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. That's great, thank you today. Um, there's just a couple uh, of questions. Firstly, someone wanted to know, do you always uh, put an NG tube in post-operatively in these patients when they go back to the ward? So very good question. Um, for tongue-based mucosectomies, I don't. For any other operation like lateral orpharyngectomy and base of tongue, definitely put NG in. And then we take the NG out. I aim to take the NG out in three days if I can. Okay. And I get guided by speech and language therapist. I don't try to take over the management of swallow if I can. Otherwise, there is an element of bias here. Yeah, I was going to say they've all got a strict speech and language protocol and an analgesic protocol post op, mm -hmm. haven't they? On the ward. Yeah. Um, Ashraf also wanted to know: uh, Is there an age limit that you cut off for patients for a candidate for tours? It's it's an interesting question, Ashraf. I think uh, uh, I wouldn't. I'm not very keen. Uh, currently to do anybody above 70 if I can. However, as the experience improves uh, for both for me, my colleague and the uh, Birmingham team, we would like to go further forward. And what I would like to do, and which I didn't share in this uh, slide, slides, I'll be very keen to do supraglottic laryngectomies. Uh, I've done it in my previous life. Nowadays, if there is a appropriate case. I try to do it with a laser. It's easier to do with the laser, but I would like to do it with the robot. It's better. You get an on-block resection. That is the greatest uh, uh, thing. And also if I, you know, some parapharyngeal masses and some recurrent cases. Excellent. And um, I just have one question as well. Um, so in these patients who may be a T1, T2 tumor, uh, who have got a lot of options open to them, a robotic excision, chemo radiotherapy or a laser, how do you counsel them? What, do you, what process do you go through with them in decision making? I think a, a patient usually gets an op option. Um, the MDT maturity is very important. And uh, we are fortunate that uh, the MDT has matured with mine and my colleagues' presence with regards to transoral surgery. 
The other important thing you need to bear in mind that, and those of you who wants to do head and neck surgery, uh, and uh, it's wise to be part of a bigger MDT because then you don't have that element of bias which comes into play, and we are all human beings, uh, if you don't have enough number of cases. If you have enough number of cases, your that human bias goes away. And then you think more rationally. So the rational thinking is, if you think, if you've got a T1, T2 tumor, if the patient is uh, HPV positive and a non-smoker, in the mid 40s, mid 50s, there is no notes there. I think the individual should be offered a transoral surgery outside of the trial. If it's inside the trial, I don't think anybody will question. Because one important thing, those of you going for exams and for consulting interviews, the patients who are in a trial, they always do better because you've got a lot of people looking after them. And that is the, my experience. So that is what I bear in mind. I don't have any bias. I'm not worried about it. I usually uh, say to the patient that I'm very happy. And I think that's been the agreement with uh, my oncology colleague, Dr. Hartley. He is very keen to see those patients because remember, even in pathos trial, he will need to give some kind of something, whether it's a radiotherapy or a chemo radiotherapy, whether it's in a de-escalated form, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, they, and that, therefore, there is no bias there. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Uh, should we just uh, wait two seconds in case anyone wants to ask a question? I'll leave it on the chat. Otherwise, we're done. Thanks, Mr. Day. That was, uh, that was really good. Oh, hi, Mr. Day. Um, hi. Just wanted to clarify, you mentioned your prophylactic neck, uh, neck dissection. Uh, that's when you tie off the um, arteries before you do tours. Uh, I mean, at the moment, it's all goes through MDT. Would you do bilateral neck if it's like a unilateral metastatic? I, I think it's a good question. Uh, well, look, my current form, we don't do any bilateral neck dissection. That is not a norm in Birmingham. Uh, if it's a bilateral disease, uh, unfortunately, for whatever, I don't know the answer, uh, they go for chemo radiotherapy. We try to stick to if the patient's not in pathos trial, we try to stick to pathos a sort of norm. And you know from the pathos, if it's an N2C disease, we don't offer them any surgery. So they're not. So currently, it's excluded. In my previous life, we've done uh, selective neck on the other side. Uh, yes, if, you're, if you can convince your MDT, you can do them. But I think there is always an element of a little bit of apprehension among a lot of the surgeons, especially, I don't think so oncologists worry about it too much, about uh, a more extra bit of complications from bilateral neck dissection. Thanks, thanks very much, Mr. Dave. Thank you. That's great. Does anybody else have any other questions? I think that's it then. So hopefully this video should be available on the AOT website at the end of the all works out but uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks mr day it was a very comprehensive thank talk. you